And then I uh, became a nun. And then it meant that first I had to be a postulant for nine months to a year working in the kitchen. And then after that, I could join the meditation. And then it was doing a twice a year retreat for three months at a time, about 10 hours a day. Okay, thank you. So um, the, the book that we're launching tonight is called What Is This? Ancient Questions for Modern Minds. You've been teaching these retreats, these SON retreats at Guy House in Devon with Stephen for the past, what, 29 or 30 years. How many people do you think have gone through these retreats with you? Well, I think uh, the first 10 years, we maybe had 10 people. And then when Gaia House moved to a bigger place, hello to the new person. And, and when Gaia House moved to the new place, then we had for another 10 years, 40 people. And now the last uh, possibly 10 years, we had uh, 50 people. Generally the retreat are full, so it's generally between 45, 50 people depending. So you have to do the calculation yourself. I don't think I'm going to do the math right here and now, thank you, but I get an idea. So what we can see that there's a, <coughs> the trend is that there's an increase in interest over the 30 year period in what you're teaching. Yes, I think, I mean, this is a very specific retreat. We do it in the kind of Korean way, but of course we, we had to make it adjustable for people now and for a week retreat which is different from a three months and then uh, but yeah people find that practice very useful either they do it on their own they do it on its own or they find it very complementary with the mindfulness practice well you've just answered my next question actually which was would you recommend to a meditation practitioner that they add the practice of questioning their existing practice or that they do it separate from it and if so why what's your reasoning so i think first the people for whom it we i would say with this what is this questioning uh, i would say you have four type of people one type of person really respond to it and so for this type of person i would say yes you can do it on its own because it really works for you another type of person they do it and it's kind of like just generate more thought then generally i would say don't do it so much because because it's kind of like words it seems to generate thought then we have to find for them to do it in a different way or not doing it so much some people it might make them a little anxious because it's really about being with uncertainty so then again these people i would say do the mindfulness of the breath just time to time you drop in a little what is this but not too much and then there are some people who really the question doesn't work whatsoever then of course you do something else so personally either you can do it on its own because it's really worked for you or i can see it very much uh, helping with the alertness with the, the vipassana aspect the looking deeply the questioning the exploration of the uh, mindfulness meditation. Mm, thank you. Um, so again, this is about the book. What is this that we're looking at here today? So if, if it doesn't probably doesn't make a lot of sense to you without reading the book, the, the book is a good read and you'll get the sense of what Martin's talking about. But in the book, and you don't say anything in your instructions about samadhi, which is states in which the mind is concentrated how they come about and what to do with them. Do you see concentration of this kind of being as value? Yeah, so in, a, we, in that retreat, we did not say much about it. It depends. Uh, uh, this is a little kind of like we could say circumstantial. This was a retreat in 2016 and we chose to talk about different things. And on that one, I did not really talk about Samadhi per se. But I talked about experiences. I did not talk in great detail in terms of concentration. So in Korea, this, uh, what is this practice is very much seen as a concentration practice at the same time as a questioning practice that it 
combine the two together. And of course, uh, they talk about samadhi in very detailed way. And actually, they made a manuscript uh, that they translated in English about uh, how they see this practice of questioning what is this. And there is a whole chapter on samadhi. But their idea about samadhi is actually, uh, so yes, of course, you can have a concentrated state. That's fine. But they, for them, it's nearly like, you know, can you keep uh, your questioning the whole time? Can you keep your questioning even at night? So can you be unperturbed in whatever circumstances? So in a way, the concentration practice is, yes, you can have a great samadhi, but it seems that they see the samadhi <coughs> as more bad having like a kind of a really relatively continuous or as continuous as you can of the practice and then the result of that and then they have different uh, level and things about it thank you and just yeah. <coughs> in the room what what the, the practice is essentially about creating a sense of perplexity of not knowing because too much of our life we're it's we're in certainty we know we're always right, and this practice is about just allowing ourselves to be uncertain, and not know, and just feel what it is to be uncertain and to be okay about uncertainty. Not to have to be Mr. or Mrs. Noel, Ms. Noel, or whatever we want to call ourselves. Uh, I've got one final question before I turn it over to people here, which is, if someone were to ask you, why should I meditate, what answer would you give them, Martin? Well, I would not say should, but if somebody is interested in meditation, then they have to find out if it suits them. You know, because basically meditation can help a lot of people to bring stability, to bring clarity, to bring openness, to bring wisdom, to bring compassion. That's the idea. After that, you have to see if the method the mindfulness or the questioning practice uh, suits you and also what kind of form it takes so i think like recently i have been teaching people who had never meditated before 65 plus and they had not necessarily chosen to meditate and it was obvious that for like we had 45 people 30 of them i would say yeah 30 of them Really, it worked very well with no problem whatsoever. And then we saw that some, uh, you had about you know, maybe five, six, seven, mm, it did not suit at all. They did not see the point of it. Or, yeah, it, it was not suited. So I would say, I would not talk about should in terms of meditate. I would talk about interest, aspiration, intention, and then see. If one is interesting, one can try it out, and then it's for one to see uh, if one does it, does, does, is it helpful or not? Because the point is not just doing the meditation. The point is, is it helping me to be more peaceful, more clear, to be more wise, to be more compassionate? Lovely. Thank you, Martin. Now I'm going to throw it open to questions from people in the room. So what, what I suggest you do is you sort of walk up to the computer, introduce yourself, say your name, and say, <clears throat> Who's going to go first? No? No, 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 I don't have this one. Someone stole your chair, I'm afraid. Hello, Martin. My name's Philip. And I wonder, um, would you think that this book has is worthwhile for ordinary people that may not be meditatively inclined? <laughs> well, it, it, it depends how much not meditatively inclined. Because you see, if they are a little bit interested, because Stephen has some very interesting connection he makes with other currents, 
Sometimes he talks more about philosophy or poetry and things of that nature. So he could talk to certain people. Uh, it might not talk to others. So uh, for people who are not so meditatively inclined, seemingly, I have a book called Meditation for Life, and that one seems to be okay. Because it's more like a table coffee book, and then friends of mine leave them on their table with photos and things, and their parents look at it, and then they want to take it home. So that one seems to work for most people. But this one, what it is, if they are the kind of exploring type, if they are interested in this kind of thing, very likely. Mm. But uh, you need to have a kind of a certain interest to, to read a book. Mm. And you need to like the style and you need to, so it's hard to say. I mean, people can try and then see if they read a page or two and then leave it or continue. Oh, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Steve. Uh, I sort of have a, a very, I've had a very simplistic way of viewing meditation in terms of either you replace, you kind of replace with an anchor, or you deal with the thoughts. You can, you kind of understand them and deal with them. And there's different techniques. But um, I guess my point is, I quite like to understand why I'm doing something what I'm cultivating uh, and the reason I do that is because I've tried other things and I've often gone off on strange tangents and then come back to something I thought that was a bit more realistic so um, what, what does this practice cultivate compared to others what's what's uh, you mean, cultivate what, what are we doing? the what is is the questioning question yeah because I don't, I don't quite I sort of understand a little bit but not much. <laughs> okay, so basically you have to see that this practice is like any practice within the Buddhist framework. That it, it combines the anchoring and the exploring together. So the Samatha and the Vipassana together in a, in a different way. Different people do it differently. So the anchoring is the fact that you come back and at the same time you come back in a non- kind of a friendly way, you see, ah, oh, so, okay, I come back. So you do the same with the what is this. You come back to the breath, you come back to the whole moment, you come back to the questioning, you come back to the whole moment. The one thing this practice adds, if it suits you, is the fact that generally it's more um, kind of uh, alert. It brings brightness and alertness. Because often the thing is that you associate meditation with being aware of the breath. Generally, the breath, if you're aware of it over time, it calms you down, no doubt. But then if you don't go into looking at impermanence, then in a way you just, you could say, cultivating calm. And sometimes, not all the time, it can become a little vague. And so what is this, the advantage, a little bit of what is this, is that it brings alertness, it brings brightness. So you're not repeating it like a mantra, you're not saying what it is, what you say, what is there? So you're really here. The words are not so important. What is important is the question mark. So you're trying to develop a sensation of question. So that when you ask a questioning, it kind of has this kind of uh, brightening effect. So that, I would say, is one of the things I notice, and people notice that when they bring the what is this, even in their mindfulness practice, it brings some kind of vividness. Because sometimes we have more tendency to associate meditation with calm. And so here with the question directly, you bring the vividness. But of course, you can also bring the vividness with the awareness of impermanence. Um. Can I ask one more question? Okay. <laughs> Hello, I'm Julia. Um, I was wondering, so a lot of people get into meditation or practice meditation as a way of managing anxiety. And I was wondering how you thought that this kind of questioning approach, how it interacts with that, whether it's something that's not appropriate or maybe whether it's something that could actually be really helpful. I was wondering if you could speak to that. So if one has a tendency to be anxious, 
I would not do the questioning too much. I would really do in combination with being aware of the breath. If the breath is not anxiety producing, because sometimes the breath can be anxiety producing. If one has had some trauma, being aware of the body can be anxiety producing. And so sometimes doing the questioning might not, but it could be. So in a way, one has to really see if I have a tendency to be anxious, and then I might be too focused on any sign, then maybe listening meditation might be better if we don't have tinnitus. And then just, you see, here I would see the what is this more, I using it as a questioning a little bit with anxiety, is that when you're anxious, is it just like a feeling, that kind of more like an emo, uh, kind of like a physiological, the whole body mind is on alert or is it more like a mental thing and you're frightening yourself with what if this happen or that happen and then the second one the mental one then it could be useful uh, to ask is this true like i'm kind of frightening myself is this true so i kind of just as a little kind of bringing this brightness in it then of course, again, it depends on the intensity of the anxiety. If it's light, you could say instead of going, oh, I am anxious, this is terrible, huh? I'm anxious, okay. What is this? But what is this as in, what is it in the experience? Where do I experience it in the body? But I would only do it like that if it's light. If it's intense, I would not go there. Uh, this evening. Uh, how do you, how do you translate uh, the what is this question into daily life? Like, um, how do you make it practical into the things you do? So I think uh, it can be useful time to time as a reminder uh, to kind of like they do something. It's interesting they do something in the mindfulness based things where you have this three minute thing and you have like back to the breath. What is this? I mean, they're not saying what is it, but what is this experience now? And then just being here. So time to time, you can bring what is this as a mean of anchoring. Or you can bring what is this as a mean of um, kind of like when you fix, what is going on? What is this? Or when you kind of like, another way would be like when you're really afraid of something. And you're making a big scenario and you might say okay let's see what happens i don't know what's going to happen so let's see what happens so in a way it's kind of you can use it in a practical way like this in the same way you would use the breath or loving kindness or anything like that but for me the practice of uh, what is this is more useful is in part more useful as in terms of the practice itself, it has a specific effect to make us over time more flexible and multi-choice. So I would see it also as that, kind of helping us to be more with uncertainty, to be more a little flexible, a little more less fixed, I would say. Yes. Dean Despina, I just want to ask you a question. You've written a lot of books between yourself and Stephen. What's prompted you to write this particular book? Okay, so this one, actually the reason was more than uh, somebody, I mean it was talks that somebody very kindly uh, wrote, uh, transcribed, and then we thought, oh, this all's together. That would be nice to have it would be nice to have it as a record of a retreat and also because the talks I, I thought was kind of interesting and not specific to this retreat. So we were really happy in a way to from talks, which is not so good when you have the transcription, but then Ramsey and Milton did such a great job that now you have a little book, which actually is quite a nice little book to have about this practice because there are so few books about this practice itself because often it's more like Japanese Zen that you will have books about. 
So this is kind of a nice little book you can have about this practice, but again, in a kind of accessible way, and that you don't have to go to uh, a temple and do a postulate for a year and then look. And I'm so happy that it's so well done and so accessible now. Are there any more questions? I think we looks like there's a no nod no no but i think we've all had our questions so martin i'm going to say thank you very much for appearing with us in new zealand and i'm going to say that with this we now formally launch globally what is this ancient question for modern mind this is the new zealand launch this is the global launch of the book and it's now on sale everywhere <laughs> including here tonight and if you'd like a copy we can take cash or you can put a uh, your bank credit information. So thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. We hope we sell lots and lots of books and um, look forward to seeing you, well, hopefully someday here in Wellington in person again at some point. We hope. We hope. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.